This is Beyond Busy. I'm Graham Alcott. I'm the author of a number of books, including the global bestseller, How to Be a Productivity Ninja. And I'm the founder of Think Productive. We work with some of the world's leading companies to help people get stuff done, but more importantly, to help people to make space for what matters. Beyond Busy is where I explore the often messy truths and contradictory relationships around topics like work-life balance, happiness and success, and explore with interesting people what makes them tick. In short, this is where we ask the bigger questions about work. My guest today is Grace Marshall. Grace is a productivity ninja with my company, Think Productive, and she's also the author of a new book, Struggle, The Surprising Truth, Beauty and Opportunity, Hidden in Life's Shittier Moments. So in this episode, we talk about a few of our own shittier moments and what they taught us. And Grace also talks about how to ask better questions, the importance of seasons and cycles, and productivity in a post-COVID world. This is Grace Marshall. Grace Marshall, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me here, Graham. So you are, the, you know you're the first person ever to do Beyond Busy twice. <laughs> Maybe I'll set a trend. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a bit of a trend. There's a couple of other people, I'm, I'm not going to name names, but a couple of other people who have books coming out who uh, uh, may well be coming up for a second time as well. Uh, but you are the first, so congratulations on the milestone. Uh, Thank you very person. much. And we're going to talk... Uh, we know each other very well, which we'll maybe talk about some of those uh, parts of it. We're going to talk about your book, Struggle, <laughs> um, which I've sort of followed all the way through, haven't I, in sort of various, various yes. different um, guises. But yeah, congratulations on it being out and Thank you. available in the world. Um, how, does it, how does it feel? Because it feels like it's, um, we'll get onto some of the subject matter, and it feels like quite a, uh, you know, there's a lot of personal stuff in the book. Um, so what just describe the feelings of having that just out in the world for all to consume <laughs> it's um in a way it feels good because it's been a thing in my head for so long um and you know and it's been a thing that I've spoken about to like to a few people like yeah we've talked about it a little bit and I've gone I've got this idea and it won't go away and and I feel like it's been in here for long enough that now actually it's time for it to get out there um, and I'm, what I'm really looking forward to is having conversations with people and, and just seeing what their take is on it and, and kind of taking that conversation further. So I'm excited about that. I'm also nervous. Um, so this is actually the first podcast conversation I'm having about it. And I oh, was wow. saying to our, um, yeah, I, I was saying to our, our, our mutual friend, Elena, our colleague, Elena, and I was like, she was like, yeah, have fun on the podcast recording today. And I was like, it's my first one. I'm really yeah, nervous. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, I know we know each other really well, but there is, um, I guess there's always a nerve thing about putting something that you've put so much of yourself into and yeah. getting it out in the world and kind of going, how's it going to go down? It's a little bit like I was reflecting. It's a little bit like when you send your kids off to school and you're like, I really hope that they're going to make friends and <laughs> they're going to be accepted. And, you know, I don't need them to be super popular or anything like that. I just want them to have like one or you know, a couple of people who really get them. And <laughs> it feels a bit like that. <laughs> nice. Um, so the, the subtitle of this book I really love. So it's called The Surprising Truth, Beauty and Opportunity Hidden in Life's Shittier Moments. Um, so, uh, I'd love to just hear more about the inspiration for the book. Was there a particular shittier moment that you went through that was the birthing point, but like, you know, what was the starting point for the book? I think it was, it was more a, a general feeling about shitty moments and a general feeling about struggle. I think in, in productivity terms, when we're looking, you know, when we're talking to people about productivity, I'm struggling usually is the opposite of being productive. Um, and there's a lot that we can do to help. So like when people are going, I'm struggling with my emails, I'm struggling with too much going on, I'm overwhelmed, things like that. There's, clearly that's what we do in our work is that we help people take away that struggle. But I noticed that in, in the work that we were doing, there's still an element of struggle that we can't take away. And I started thinking, actually, I don't think we should take it away. Yeah. Because actually sometimes the fact that we're struggling with something doesn't mean that we're in the wrong place. Sometimes it means we're in absolutely the right place. 
Um, so I felt like there was this thing around struggle that we weren't talking about um, in productivity, yeah. but generally in the world as well. Um, so I just wanted to have a different conversation about struggle. Yeah, and I suppose there's, it is one of those things, isn't it, that it, it sort of doesn't come up. And then I saw someone the other day say that your book talks about it without without verging into I think the phrase was failure porn yes as well. <laughs> it's like when people do talk about it, it they almost go overboard on it as well right but then mm. for, for the most part it's this taboo thing that we don't talk about when we make mistakes or when things are imperfect or when things go wrong yeah. um, we tend to sweep that under the carpet do you think that's a, a sort of Instagram culture thing or do you think it's always been that way I think I think the Instagram culture probably makes adds to it um, I think the, the, there's various things that add to it. So the stiff upper lip, um, the yeah. whole keep calm and carry on. Um, yeah, they, they all have their place, but I think they all add to the, oh gosh, must not tell people I'm struggling. Um, and actually, I think in the recent years where we've seen more conversation about mental health and that becoming a more open conversation, I think we've, we've seen more people start to talk about struggle in that way. But I think there's still, a, I think that you're right, the conversation's been limited, so we have talked about it, but we've only talked about it in a particular way. So either we talk about it as just the inconvenient necessity that you need to get over. It's like, yeah, of course, everyone's gonna struggle. You just need to hustle on through and push harder. Or we see it as, um, we talk about it as like, oh gosh, yeah, they're not coping very well, are they? So there's the, a bit of a, a shame, a taboo. Um, there's kind of a, I don't want to admit to it because it seems like failure and it seems like weakness. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and those conversations are, are limited and they're limiting as well because there's not much we can then do with it. Yeah, I was talking to someone the other day about the whole model and the whole sort of narrative and notion of charity, right? And we were talking about, so I'm involved in uh, this choir uh, for people who are homeless and people who've experienced homelessness in some way. And often when they come to the choir, we do have people who are rough sleeping, but actually most of them are then they're they're in a bed, right? They're they're housed, they're in hostels, they're in supported accommodation, that kind of thing. Um, but the whole sort of, I guess, the dynamic of it when we're there as volunteers, so we're there as the music volunteers to you know help people to hit their notes and learn their parts and all that sort of thing. But the whole notion of it is like we're here, sort of, we're doing something good for you, and you need help, so we're here to help kind kind of and sometimes it just feels really sort of deeply uncomfortable yeah but the thing about it is right it's like i could be there as a volunteer and you know there's this kind of weird awkward power dynamic thing that i just talked about but like i could be there feeling really depressed or struggling in my own life right and also the person on the other end of that help like could be someone who has incredible skills that I really need at, you know, some place in my life, learning guitar or like helping me with something in my business or like helping me with DIY, which I'm really rubbish at. Right. And so mm. I think maybe the, maybe part of the conversation that we don't have and where I think this is a really important thing is that people are just really multifaceted and yeah. we're so used to sort of labeling someone as a success or mm. as a failure or as this or as that, that we forget that most people are all of the things. Like, yes. all the time, yeah. like, <laughs> Absolutely. In different ways, right? Yeah, and some, some, sometimes the, the most dignity you can give somebody is to allow them to speak into your world, allow them yes. to help you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because that's, that's the fullness of us being human is that we give and we receive. Yes. And if it's only ever one way, it's like it's only half the picture. That's totally it. I think dignity really like hits the nail on the head of so many things. You know, I think mm. um, anything that involves kindness has to be done with dignity. Right. It just kind of feels yeah. like it's at the heart of, of all of that kind of stuff. Um, let's talk about some of the uh, particular things in the book. So what's lovely about the structure of the book is it's all these kind of little vignettes, right? Like a page or a couple of pages or three pages long, and then it moves on and it's the next thing and it's the next thing. So it just feels like there's always going to be particular, I think for anyone reading this, there's going to be particular bits that just like smack you in the face and resonate. 
Mm. And then other bits where you're like, yeah, cool. I kind of knew that. And other things where you're like, oh, that's a whole another thing. So I guess I'm just, I'm not, so rather than trying to summarize the whole book, I think I'm just going to pick out two or three of the things where I was like, oh yeah, that's cool. I really like yeah, that. So just let's dive in. a couple of highlights for me. So um, page 53, you talk about um, asking better questions. Shall I read a bit of it? Yeah, go for it. And, and then I'd love you to um, tell me a bit more. And there was another bit where you talk about uh, a whole, like you're good with questions. That's like a, one of your things, I think. Um, that bit where you talk about the packing to go on holiday and asking yourself those questions <laughs> instead, yes. of, uh, instead of just packing too many clothes. But um, yeah, so better questions to ask. What am I seeing? What am I not seeing? What am I making this to mean? What else could it mean? What's great about this problem? Um, and these are all questions that challenge our default to black and white fight or flight thinking. Questions that invite us to look in between and upside down. What if questions are also great openers? What if there's more to this? What if that's fear talking? What if this is precisely where I can do my best work? What if this is a gift or good information? What if this is God or the universe clearing my diary? What does this make, make space for? What might be possible here and now that wasn't before? Mm. Love that. You're going, yeah, like it's your words. <laughs> You're like agreeing with it, like, yeah, oh, that's, that's good. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think I wrote that because, so the, the section just before that was about how we tend to have a fight or flight um, view of struggle. So yeah. either this is a battle I need to fight, or this is like danger I need to run away from, or avoid, or hide from. And, and when that happens, the way that our brain responds to that is by asking very binary questions like, what's safe? What's dangerous? Mm, um, yeah. And that kind of homes in on like, I've just either got to do this or I've got to do this. Um, and it gives us, I mean, it's useful if you're in a life threatening situation and it's like, do I fight this bear or do I run away? <laughs> you know, that's, that's useful. But when in most of our life and most of our work, it's just not useful, that kind of yeah. you know, narrow thinking. And so the reason why I like questions like that is it, it invites curiosity. So it activates curiosity, which is kind of like the antidote to fear. So fear is the one that says like, what's safe or run away or you. Know, but actually curiosity is when we start to widen the view. Mm. So then we start to go, hang on a minute. Yes, that looks like that's, maybe that's a change. So if you imagine an email's just landed in your inbox that is giving you something surprising, like an unexpected, response or an expected piece of news. Um, particularly at the moment, like in this past year when we've had so much change, so much uncertainty, the if you know if our I mean you talk about lizard brain in your book, if our lizard brain is um is particularly active, it's just gonna jump to like, you know, how do I either quash this, control this, or make it go away. Yeah. But actually the curiosity factor is like, but what is this actually? Mm. Yeah, maybe this surprise, maybe this curveball isn't something that's coming at me that I've got to bat away. Maybe this is an opportunity to go yeah. deeper into a relationship or to you know, to do something new. Yeah, um, that feels like a, a neat segue to talk about a time where we asked those kind of questions about a year or so ago, which was we were just at the beginnings of COVID. And so I should probably just for context of people who um, who don't know. So you and I work together. You're one of our productivity ninjas within Think Productive as well. And we had this meeting where we'd had quite a few of our clients canceling on us or uh, delaying uh, workshops and, and things like that. And we had this kind of crisis meeting going, this COVID thing looks like it's, you know, it's for real. This is pretty serious. And it all felt like doom and gloom. And then I remember at some point on the call, just thinking, well, what if there's, you know, this feels like a threat to our business. Mm -hmm. um, but usually when there's a threat, there's also an opportunity, right? So yeah. my mind sort of shifted to, okay, so not what do we need financially, but what do our clients need right now? Mm -hmm. Oh, it turns out we have some of those answers, right? In what we do. Yeah. Um, so we then, um, over the course of, about three weeks, wrote three, didn't we? Which was um, very <laughs> rapid process. I think usually one workshop of Think Productive takes six to nine months. Six months, yeah. Basically, <laughs> and like we wrote three in three weeks, 
Um, and uh, I think I think two of those, one of those was very based around, you know, uh, dealing with uncertainty. But the other two, like, stack up really well to this day, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd love you to just talk a little bit about your experience of, of that and that, that sort of period of two or three weeks where basically me and you would do these calls and then, you know, we'd be writing slides and writing train the trainer notes and just kind of making all this stuff happen at like rapid pace. Like, how was that for you? It, do you know what? That's, uh, that was one of my highlights of last year. <laughs> and it's, it's really funny because writing content and um, designing workshops is not my thing. You know, I love delivering. Yeah. I love having those in the moment conversations, but coming up with the deck, coming up with the structure, it's not my natural strength. It's not something I normally go to. But um, I really enjoyed it because there was a collaboration there because it was kind of back and forth. And also there was, I guess, room for imperfection. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. One of the things that, that I noticed with the pandemic, with everybody having to do new things and try new things and experiment, our collective tolerance for imperfection went up. So yeah. it was like, you know, that there's freedom there in terms of like, we don't have to get this perfect. We don't have to get this right. It just needs to be helpful. And it's great news for me, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I think the other thing that was really interesting around that for me personally was it gave me a sense of purpose. Mm. Um, so, yeah. you know, I think when the pandemic first hit, there was a lot of what do we do now? And there was a lot of um, kind of people feeling in limbo, whether that's because they're on furlough or because like they're you know, not sure what's happening. So I think you had two things. You had people in crisis mode who you know, it was like actually either my job's under threat or I'm on the front lines and I just need to go into crisis mode and, and do stuff. And then you had people feeling in limbo. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, having that period of going, right, ah, this is what we're doing. Having that clear story of like, this is what good work looks like right now. This is what success looks like right now. Um, that gave me a sense of purpose that was massively helpful for my, my mental health, if yeah. not anything else. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and- I mean, I would definitely echo that in terms of the the sense of purpose and the sense of, okay, cool, here's a thing that we need to, re- this is a challenge that we need to really jump to. And there's, there's something about challenges that are sort of time limited and present themselves as a bit of a shock. And then there's like a, a deadline to them. I think it's always, it's always an exciting thing. It's, mm. I guess, for a similar reason people really love working in startup cultures right because it's like there's a challenge like that like every week that kind of rapid growth rapid development kind of cycle of startups is i can see why it gets very addictive um and i definitely felt a bit like once those were done i just maybe two or three weeks down the line i definitely collapsed about three weeks after that (laughs) because i've been sort of working weekends and really just like pushing it pushing it and I definitely had a couple of days of just feeling totally flat and empty and, and kind of after the Lord Mayor show kind of feeling. Did you have the same? Yeah, that's, that's the morning after, isn't it? It's the hangover <laughs> uh, that comes after. Um, and and I, you know, I write about that in the book because I think it's, it often takes us by surprise. So we expect yeah. to feel tired or stressed or whatever in the moment. Um, but actually, sometimes it's not until afterwards that it catches up with us. Yeah. And, um, and and that's the other reason why I think, you know, yes, we can absolutely respond to crisis and we can do that, like kind of that startup energy that you just described there is brilliant. But if that's ongoing and we don't have time where we can collapse, <laughs> yeah, then actually that's not sustainable. That's that's where we get to burn out. Absolutely. Um, how long have you been a Productivity Ninja for now? How many years? <sighs> 2012 back end of 2012 is when I started yeah yeah so the best part of a decade <laughs> um, what do you th- so you've you've seen a lot of work cultures and talked productivity with just a whole range of different organizations really and maybe we can talk about about some of those but what have you seen change particularly over the last year like how has the last year with covid uh, been different in terms of working cultures and how people are viewing productivity? Good question. I think, I think there's definitely been a lot more, a lot more intentional thoughts around like well-being, work-life balance. I don't particularly like that phrase, but it encompasses the kind of like 
you know, the actually how do I want my my work and my life to be. So I think for a lot of people being at home more, getting to see their kids more, eating lunch in their own kitchen, you know, all those kind of things. Um, I think there's been an, an increased awareness of like, oh yeah, this is the stuff that really matters to me. Um, and this is the stuff, stuff that maybe I didn't have time for uh, as much time as I wanted for before. And I didn't even realize it because I was so busy. Um, so I think particularly I'm hearing a lot of, I think particularly people who worked in the city as well, because there was the long commute, there was the long days at the office and they come back and you just knack it and you just can kind of repeat it. So I think there's been a, a bit of a wake up call on that front from people and a bit of a, a recognition of like, actually this does matter to me um, personally. And I think there's also been, I mean, on the work side, I guess there's also been a lot more conversation about mental health and checking in on people and seeing the human side of things. I, th I've seen, I think we've seen a, an increase in kindness being on the radar for companies and not just something you look at maybe once a year on like wellbeing week. Um, but I think you know, I've also seen a lot of experimenting. So, you know, like we talked about that kind of um, threat, that disruption, we, in the middle of that, there's, there's freedom to experiment with things. So we've seen people just experiment with different ways of working, different habits because of, um, because they've been able to, either because they've had to, or they've had the, the ability to. Um, but then I've also seen a lot of um, just long hours and work-life blur. And maybe it started off as like, we just need to get this done, like heads down, you get, get on with it. And then that's kind of continued and continued. And what started off as a sprint has then become a year-long marathon. Yeah, right. I'm seeing a lot of exhaustion, to be honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true, isn't it? And one of the things you talk about in the book is that sometimes it feels terrifying to rest. Mm. So do you want to talk a bit more about that and, and just the importance of rest? Yeah. So rest is something that often comes up with um, a lot of my coaching clients. Um, so yeah, people start working with me one to one. Often we start off with the, the productivity piece, but inevitably it always comes down to rest. And it's amazing how many super productive, high achieving people really, really struggle with rest. And it's like, well, what right, is what's that? on my mark right here? <laughs> yes. Productivity ninjas take breaks. <laughs> exactly. And I think, you know, there's um, the reason why it's terrifying to rest is because <clears throat> it catches up with you. Yeah, you know, when you rest is when everything catches up with you. It's when you can actually start to kind of process what's been going on rather than just react to it. Um, it's where my, you might start replaying a conversation and go, yeah, do you know what? That I didn't show up on my best there. That didn't go how I wanted to um, and have to reckon with that. Um, it's also, there's, there's also a lot of trust involved in rest because you're stepping away and you're releasing, I guess some people would say the illusion of control, but like you're releasing control. Um, and yeah, there's things that go through your head like, what if everything falls apart? Yeah, when I step away. But worse, what if nothing falls apart? And that means that I'm completely redundant and wasn't eating in the first place. <laughs> yeah, there's all sorts of kind of existential questions that come up um, that, that actually is what's stopping a lot of people from completely switching off. So, you know, when, when we talk about in workshops, when we talk about taking breaks and switching off and having a life outside of work, people like the sound of it. But then when we start talking about not looking at your emails when you're on holiday, you, the conversation often starts off with, but I can't because I might miss something, I might get in trouble, someone else might, you know, might have a go at me for it or might be let down by me or disappointed by me. But inevitably, you kind of go around the cycle of looking up for the external factors and inevitably always comes back to myself. It's yeah. like, yeah, it's because I'm, I'm, I've got my FOMO, I've got my fear of missing out. You know, I, I'm worried that I will lose control over what I think I've got control over if I step away and then bad things are going to happen. Yeah, I feel like being busy is like an escape. It was, it's a facade and an escape from sitting with your own soul and sitting with your own mortality, right? And I can see why that's ridiculously addictive. It but is. I think what's, what's funny is how through this COVID period, people have had no choice but to not be busy, right? Like, okay, you're just locked up in your house now 
for three mm-hmm. months like there's no gigs and theater and nothing else to you know, you know sort of jump on a train for so just you know deal with your soul you know i think that's definitely been a big um thing is there anything that for you personally has really just come up over this last year because you you've also had a lot going on you've moved house and various other things over that that time as well uh, i think you're building a new house in your garden as well aren't you? <laughs> yeah. as well. Uh, but what's come up for you over that year in terms of um you know recognizing covid as a as a shittier moment and then the surprising truth that that came up as part of that Mm, good question yeah so we moved house the december before um before covid hit um and it was really interesting because i think the, the weeks coming up to it there were definitely warning signs for me that i was going too fast and those warning signs for me it normally happens with car accidents um <laughs> Not, I'm, and I'm laughing because they're not like major car accidents. They're like really stupid car accidents. How many car accidents have you had? I don't know. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> so, in yeah, my car insurance premiums currently are very high because I, I lost my no claims bonus in, in the space of, I think it's in the space of three months, I had two claims. Right. And they were both really stupid ones. One was I took a wing mirror off um, a stationary car. Um, and that was when I was on the school run coming back. Um, it was pouring down with rain. I was, you know, I had w- one child in the car. I was worried about the other child thinking, should I go and pick him up and or should, try and find him? And I was overtaking, I just took off. Um, and that actually really scared me because it did. I did think, what if that had been a cyclist? Mm, um, yeah. You know, so yes, it was a wing mirror. It was actually a very expensive wing mirror. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that, that was one. And then the other one was even more ridiculous because it was, um, I, again, school run, right? School runs have a lot to, <laughs> but um, I, I had just uh, picked up my daughter. My mum was in the car with me um, and I picked her up, come back, I just pulled into the drive and the estate agent called and the phone was hooked up to my Bluetooth um, on the car and because we were still trying to sell our old house at this point. Yeah. And so I just yeah, had a quick conversation with the estate agent and then, uh, you know, and that was it. And then I was like, right, just park up. And I realized I'd kind of pulled in at a wrong angle to kind of park where I normally park. But I thought, oh no, Grant's not here. Um, so I'll park where he normally parks. And I completely forgot my dad had parked there. <laughs> so I reversed straight into the back of my dad's car. Good work. Well, <laughs> Which was you pretty know, shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, at least it keeps it in the family, eh? You don't have yeah. to, you know. <laughs> liaise with strangers in awkward, uh, <laughs> in awkward ways. yeah but yeah basically it was it was just you know one of those things that um you know at the time i was just clocking it going you know there's a nag in my head going you need to pay attention to this it's there's like a theme it's... there of um yeah when you start to have not enough attention to park a car safely that's probably a, probably yeah. a canary in the coal mine Exactly. And it's it's like the warning lights that you get in a car that you go, oh, I'll look at that later. or It's probably nothing. Yeah. And like eventually it's going to make you pay attention. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I think those were the things that were kind of on the precipice of, of COVID. And because and I was doing a lot of traveling, it was just like one thing after another. And I, I do enjoy it. I love the traveling. I love seeing new places. I love being on the move. Um, and then, of course, with COVID, it's just it all stopped. It was just me in this room, you know, talking to a screen. Um, and I think I, I, there was a period where I was highly unproductive, you know, in terms of, I didn't get much done. Days, the days felt really, they felt like the last days um, after your GCSEs or the first days of being a parent yeah, where the, right. the days were impossibly long, but they seem to fly by and you don't get much done. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I felt like I, I just had to come to terms with that and recognize that it was, probably a result of a long period of being on the go, um, but also a result of what's going on right now in terms of there's so much, there was so much uncertainty, there was so much going on that you know, my brain was coping with all this new stuff. Mm. And so therefore wasn't able to really do much else. Um, so yeah, it's I'm not sure there's, there's some kind of massive profound thing out of that, but I think that those are the, those are the things that stand out to me. There is one of those one of those things that I think a lot of people have underestimated over the last year, though, is that 
when when reality is shifting from under your feet right mm. you know, in terms of lockdowns and vaccines and all the all these things like you're having to pay attention to that at the same time as pay attention to what's in your world that you can control and i think a lot of people have missed the fact that that stuff is really exhausting mentally mm -hmm. because it's all of that involves a thousand tiny decisions right about how am i going to react to this and and how am i going to deal with it and like no wonder people have just been a bit less productive i think over this mm -hmm. period because that is just that's just a natural sort of mental drain drain on energy i was actually thinking this morning how um i i had this thought this morning which i haven't had for about five years and the thought is oh who's the american president again oh yeah it's joe biden and for four years, there was no chance of having that thought because it was just like Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump. He's done another thing. He's done another awful thing. And like, it's like a relentless thing that is, I think, just such a mental drain on people. Mm. But you don't really notice at the time because you're just in it. But yeah. now it's like, you know, thank goodness you've got like an American president, you know, being sensible um, and just also just not you know, baiting people based on their race and just all these other terrible mm. things that you can just be like, oh, is he? Is he president? OK, cool. <laughs> like, it's yes. just sort yeah. of, it just almost doesn't register anymore. So that that was quite fun to to sort of recognize that, again, that's another one of those things that just, you know, like it, there is a mental cost to how much attention you can put on productivity based on, you know, and based based on what's going on in the rest of the world. And I don't really consume media, you know, like there's mm. people who watch news regularly or have this belief that they need to sort of constantly be in touch with stuff. And maybe they do need to be in touch with certain types of news as part of their job too, right? So there's a lot of people who just have an obligation to be informed all the time. Um, and so they must feel that much more, but presumably it's also much harder to sort of recognize the cost of that too, when you're like mm. really deep in it all the time. Yeah, I think if you're always in a, if you're always in a very reactive atmosphere, you, you could, it's hard to see that. It's hard mm, to see that in yourself because yeah. you're just constantly just going, well, what's the next thing I need to react to? Definitely. And I think we, we see that a lot in, in, we've seen that a lot in the workplace, haven't we? Of people being so busy, they don't know, you yeah, know, they know that they're too busy, but they don't, no idea how to kind of do anything about it or where to stop. Yeah, you know, and our, our sort of, you know, stock phrase that we talk about a lot is is productivity is about making space for what matters mm. and the space part of that is really important which is a nice little segue into um, something else in your book so you talk about the idea of letting your work breathe mm -hmm. so I'd love to love to hear a bit more about letting your work breathe and what that means to you yeah so there's definitely you know there, there is there's space for the kind of, I guess there's there's a certain type of productivity that is about leaning in, isn't there? Of like kind of going, right, I you know, need to nail myself to the seat, put, put a Pomodoro timer on, eat the frog. You know, it's like, you know, do the thing. Yeah. But I think there's also an element of it which is about knowing when to leave it alone, knowing when to let it breathe, knowing when you just need to walk away and come back rather than nail yourself to the seat. And particularly when it comes to like the writing work that you and I both do, yeah, there's there's sometimes where you can just stare at the screen and you're putting in the time, yeah. and you, even even when you've got the energy and the attention available, but it's just not coming together because you're just forcing those ideas to come together and it's not happening. And it's not until you walk away, you go do some singing or a walk or you chat into a friend or something like that, and then some some suddenly something just lands and you're like, ah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's giving space, I think, for those things um, and, and recognising that you can't force everything. It's not always about speed. Sometimes it's about giving it space, walking away um, and then letting that, letting that bubble up and letting it marinate as well. And the same thing, it's not just your own work. It can be you know, if, you're, if you're going through a period of change with, change with the team, for example, um, you know, if you've just been working on a project and you suddenly go, right, it's time to change and you're presenting it to the rest of the team and, um, and then it's the first time they've heard about it, you might need to give them space to, yeah. Yeah. You know, to think about it and go, well, what does this actually look like? Um, I mean, we've had conversations like that, haven't we, where maybe you've been thinking about something for a while and you tell the rest of us, we're like, whoa, where did that come from? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Um, and we've probably done that to you as well. So I think there's, there is, um, I think a, something that we don't, I guess, face it, you know, because it's like air, isn't it? We don't notice it until it's gone. So it's not something you notice when, when it's there, but it's like, if it's not there, we definitely notice it. And it's yeah. about kind of making space for that. And I think in terms of teams and leadership and that sort of stuff, the other thing is, you know, when you're trying to push things forward and change things, often it can be quite relentless. It's like, I'm doing this, and now I'm on to the next thing, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this. And sometimes teams just need that space to just let everything that's just happened settle, right? Mm -hmm. Just establish what the normal is now. And then, like, after a period of that, you've got a team that's then ready to take on the next challenge or whatever. But if you constantly, if you're constantly evolving all the time, that can just get exhausting for people, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because all those little things that we, we take for granted, like the little routines, the little like, I know what this means. So the, even a simple thing like, okay, can you respond to the sales inquiry? Like normally it'd be a really simple thing, but if you just changed your CRM system, yeah, it could be a whole lot. Like, what do I do here? Or if you've yeah, just changed right. the products or like the pricing, you know, suddenly it's like, oh, hang on a minute, what am I doing here? And it's again, those thousand tiny decisions mm. um, start racking up. But that is also, that is also productivity and transforming productivity in a nutshell, isn't it? So off, when we arrive at an office or with a team, and we're talking about some of the core content from Productivity Ninja, or we're doing getting your inbox to zero, or we're doing a how to fix meetings, or whatever the whatever the thing is. Like, we're not arriving from a starting point where people aren't capable of doing anything. We start, but we're starting from a point of view where people are not regularly looking and analysing their own habits because they're just habitual, mm. right? And so that sense of having, in order to get, in order to create a better habit. The hardest part is you have to go back and start thinking about your existing habit, which yeah. is just really annoying, isn't it? Like, you, like because <laughs> you don't want to be thinking about the process of the work. You want to just think about the work yeah. and being forced to, to take that step back into, oh, there's this CRM system. And I, knew, I used to know how to do this. And now because the system's new, I don't know how to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. That's just it's an inherently frustrating, annoying thing, isn't it? But it's like absolutely essential to go through that pain point in order to yeah. get to i've now got something which is effortless and better than what it was before yeah, yeah. Right? exactly and that's the, i guess that's the difference between transformation and efficiency you know because like mm. you know often you know when we're kind of looking for efficiency we're just looking like how do i do this quicker better you know yeah. faster um and that's you know our brain likes to do that that's how routines come along our brain goes oh you've done this before okay we can do this quick and we can make it into a routine so you don't have to think about it you know, then it makes it much more efficient but then when you're doing transformation you're actually breaking that efficiency and breaking that routine in order to create something better so you have to break it first rather than just like i'll oh, just take this and refine it yeah there's a couple of other bits in the book which both feel like they lead on quite nicely from that um and one of them is about seasons and cycles so mm. in talking about routines um tell us the importance of seasons and cycles when it comes to productivity yeah so i think we we work and often live in a world that's very much kind of 24 7 things don't really shut down much um you know and and we and technology technology can make things 24 7 but i think human beings can't be and yeah so we've we forget that actually we're, everything in nature has seasons. So you know, we invented the light bulb so that we could see for longer and kind of you know, work into the night. Um, you know, we've invented things like you know, Wi-Fi and email so that we can talk to people and communicate with people at any time, anywhere. Um, but then that also means that we get trapped into a place where we feel like we need to be always on. and. You know, that there's there's no natural stoppage to when things go quiet or things shut down um, and you know it used to be there were certain times like where if when we were working in the office the people would often say actually the best times are before everyone if I get in before everybody else or if I'm still in the office and everyone else has left but even now when people are working across time zones and flexible hours there's not even that clear like yeah. lights out moment and so then what we find is that it's, it's up to us to put those rhythms back in place to go like when do i start when do i stop 
you know, when is my fallow period? When is my rest? Um, when am I on? When am I off? Um, and just kind of getting into the idea. That's why I don't like the word work life, work -life balance because it's, yeah, it's static. Yeah. You know, I like the idea of work life rhythm because then you've got times when you go fast, you go slower, you've got kind of the seasons. And then recognizing, so for me, like recognizing that certain parts of last year was a fallow season. It was a season yeah. where I'm not doing much, but actually I'm allowing things to settle. I'm kind of reconnecting with certain things and allowing to, myself to go deep. Um, and I had a similar one actually after the second book, so How to Be Really Productive, came out in 2015. And I had this season of doing lots of book promotion, writing articles about it. At the same time, I was doing a lot of international travel with Think Productive because um, we had this big client who had a lot of work in, in Europe and Scandinavia and, and, and in the UK. So it was pretty full on for that kind of couple of years. And then I just hit a wall. Um, and, you know, and I was like, I love writing, but I have no idea what I want to write about. I, can't, I couldn't write anything because I had nothing fresh in my head. Um, and I remember picking up Amanda Palmer's book, which was um, The Art of Asking. Yeah. that somebody else had recommended to me. And one of the things she talks about in there was the idea of um, the creative cycle being kind of a, a combination of collecting, connecting, and sharing. So you collect your materials, mm. you connect them to make something new, um, and then you share that with the world. Yeah. And one of the things she pointed out is that most people have a natural bent towards one of those things. And for me, actually, my natural place is sharing. That's what I love doing the most. Yeah. But I was all shared out because I'd like spent, you know, I'd had so much, done so much sharing that I was all shared out and I needed to go back to collecting new ideas so that I've got new things to connect, you know, new dots that I can connect and start to have something new to come out and share again. Yeah, mine is definitely connecting. I love finding the, you know, making sense and finding the connections and stuff and... Um, yeah. I don't know. I used to, I used to have this thought that if I could just sit in my shared and write books and I never had to try and promote them or sell them, I'd be really happy. <laughs> and I think over the last couple of years, I've sort of reluctantly concluded that actually the the work I used to th I used to think that the work was writing the book, mm. and then marketing was just was just you know what you needed to do to sell sell the work, and what I've noticed is that most of the people who are way more successful than me and I really admire in doing uh, this kind of similar stuff is they view the book as the excuse to then do the work, right? Yeah. So the book is like the thing that opens the door, but the work is, is you know, the podcast and the keynotes and the and the sharing the ideas on online and, you know, and get, getting those other messages out to people. So yeah, like I've definitely, you know, it take, took me 10 years before I decided to launch an email mailing list and various things like that. Like I'm a bit, <laughs> bit behind with all this stuff, but um, I do definitely feel like that's shifted for me. Mm. And then the cycles thing. So I kind of think about it, like I agree with you on the work life balance uh, kind of terminology. It's one of those things that everyone understands, but it's a really naff term. Um, but I just, I continue to use it because it's the thing that everyone understands. It's a shortcut, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it's annoying, isn't it? Uh -uh. But, you know, I sort of think about it like my mornings is, so I have my three C's, which you, you mentioned briefly in the book, which is uh, really nice to get a little mention there. So <laughs> three C's is, is the morning time for me is always create. So that's very much kind of heads down, particularly the start of the week. I always see that's like my best creative time. Uh, in the mornings and then the afternoons is about collaborate so that's when my job is basically to stop being the bottleneck just help everybody else to free up their stuff and then it really changed me when I started to think about there being a third component which was chill right so just mm -hmm. resting and noticing that there's like there's such a such a thing as good chill versus bad chill right so bad chill for me is like mindlessly scrolling through my phone <laughs> and looking at Instagram. Or ranting on Twitter. Ranting on Twitter, which I don't do anymore. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm completely off the Twitter these days, which is which is lovely. Uh, turns out, like, no one cared. <laughs> like, I was not sharing my, my uh, you know, uh, miserable opinions on it. But, um, 
noticing that there's a, there's such a thing as good chill, right? So mm-hmm. picturing what does that look like and what's going to nourish me versus what's just going to be the thing that I decide to do with the last bit of my energy at the end of the day. You know, so if you can proactively design that when you have good energy, it ends up being better than if you just rely on yourself when you're tired to make good decisions because you just won't because you're tired. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and that, yeah, that's really shifted for me. Um, so, yeah, like I often talk to people about that and they say, well, the thing is, you know, I wouldn't be able to just have my whole morning as create time uh, and not have meetings in that slot and whatever. And it's like, no, the point of this is not to say that you need to not have meetings between this time. It's just that there are those three different things. Your create time might be half an hour a day and most mm-hmm. of your day might be collaborate. Um, you know, these things are kind of like elastic bands, right? They, you stretch them to whatever point you need them for you. But the point is just to think about that delineation mm-hmm. of attention, right? Create, collaborate, chill. Yeah, and have that kind of distinction rather than it all being blurring into one. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. And particularly, I think I'm quite good at being boundary with my evenings and stuff of just, you know, the email is not on, I'm not responding to stuff and whatever. It's. I think it's become more difficult in the last year where we do a lot more of our team communication on whatsapp and we've got people in different time zones and stuff and like mm-hmm. i'm pretty good if i see i'll i'll read it but i won't engage with it so i'll i'll have a little moment of like oh yeah that's happened and then i'll <laughs> but i'll be able to do that and not be thinking oh i need to reply and mm-hmm. you know and i'm able to sort of do that switch off but yeah i think it um you know potentially has got harder with our our use of whatsapp for sure yeah uh, let's talk about one other bit from the book, which I really loved, which is you quoting, I think she's called Josie George. Is that right? Mm, yeah. Josie George. And um, so this is a section called holding your pain without feeding it. And I just love this, which was actually talking about Twitter. Twitter can have, be full of, you know, much smarter <laughs> opinions than mine. Uh, so this is Josie George from February 2020. And she says, holding painful feelings in a way that honours them but doesn't hurt anyone else is a very hard thing. I've learnt to feel it without feeding it, if that makes sense. It's a great lumbering bear under my skin, but I can hold it there calmly, making sure it doesn't bite anyone until it goes to sleep again. Mm. That's so cool. Um, Tell me about Josie George, because you were telling me just a little bit before we started recording. So Josie's a really good friend of mine, and um, she uh, she lives in, in the West Midlands, so she's fairly local to me. And um, the thing about Josie is that she has chronic pain and disability. Um, basically, she's a bit of an enigma to doctors. They don't quite know what's wrong with her. Um, but it, what it does is it limits her mobility, and it also limits a lot of her energy. So she has to be really careful with what she takes on, how much she takes on, that sort of thing. Her, um, her book actually has just come out in February and um, it's called A Still Life and it's a beautiful book. Um, mm-hmm. I highly recommend it. Um, it kind of charts her journey then, so you know, through her childhood to where she is now, but also talks about her kind of charts her journey through the, a year of her life just before COVID. Um, and she manages to to write a beautifully honest, truthful, real, and hopeful uh, view of of living. Um, and one of the things that I, well, two things I really appreciate about spending time with her. One is that she makes me slow down because yeah. slow is the only pace she can do. And she just reminds me, it's like, oh yeah, we can do these things slowly. And actually when you slow down, you notice so much more. Like if you read her writing, it is in such, there's such rich detail in there. There's such care taken over each word. It kind of really lands um, because because she notices so much because she can't fly by at 100 miles an hour. Um, but the other thing that um, she's often obviously really familiar with is this is the concept of pain because it's a constant companion. And so the whole thing about learning to hold your pain without feeding it, um, she knows on a, a very sort of visceral level in yeah. terms of sensations, but also from an emotional level, I think there's a lot we can learn in that, in, in that you know, often when we hurt, we react. Mm. Um, and that's when we might lash out or that's when we might cut someone off. Um, you know, and we have these reactions, 
because we're reacting from that pain. And, and, so, and often what we do is by doing that, we're just feeding it. We're just yeah. making it worse. And so you know, the idea of just being able to hold it and going, and so you're not dismissing it. You're not saying like, you're not burying it. You're just saying, oh shit, like this hurts. Mm. Allowing yourself to really feel that rather than like, what do I do about this? I've got to do something to make it go away. Just going, this hurts or this sucks. Yeah. Allowing yourself to be there and acknowledge that. And then you can then move on to, okay, what does this actually mean? Is this a pain I need to do something about? Is this just something that I need to live with? Um, you know, the, the whole kind of reckoning of like, well, what does it actually mean? So that going back to asking better questions um, before we then dive into, okay, what do we want to do? Rather than jumping straight from, ouch, that hurts, I need to do something. Yeah, that whole thing of hurting people hurt people, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I've, I've been sort of thinking quite a lot about trauma over the last year or so partly with a couple of uh close friends who've been going through quite a, a, a serious amount of trauma and kind of recognizing trauma um and also talking to a couple of people who've said i have some trauma around this thing but i've struggled to acknowledge it or take it seriously because there's this belief that well my trauma is nowhere near as bad as somebody else's trauma mm. right and it's like it's just trauma like yeah. it doesn't judge it just is and so yeah. i think that's a really interesting um sort of loop back to the whole notion of struggle mm. um my i suppose when i was thinking about struggle and you you sent me a an email before saying, can you talk about your own struggle? And I wrote, one yeah, thing I want to know about your shitty moments. <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote one thing down, which I think, um, really speaks to that, that thing about slowing down, um, that you just talked about with Josie there. So the thing that, the, the thing that changed for me between first releasing how to be a productivity ninja and then releasing the five year anniversary edition was that in between that time I had a kid, right. And, um, He's a kid who had, say again. A big change. <laughs> it was a pretty big change. Um, but actually it wasn't just the having a kid bit that was, the, the having a kid bit in, in, in some ways is, uh, you know, it's easy, isn't it? But like um, the bit that was, that, that, that was the traumatic bit was actually the pregnancy and birth and him getting diagnosed with a chromosome disorder and then uh, them not knowing what to do about that. And we were th thinking he was gonna have to have, have major surgery and all this stuff. And um, what was funny was that he, at every point in the process kind of defied the expectations. So when he was born, there was like three doctors, uh, three midwives and three surgeons all in the room for his birth, right? They were just mm -hmm. like, right, ready? Because what they thought they were gonna have to do was basically give him open heart surgery, like at birth and then figure out what else was wrong with him and then bring him back sort of thing. And then, so when they, uh, it was all to do with his throat and stuff. So they got him out and then the first thing they did, they put him on this table and then they put this camera down his, uh, down into his stomach and they were like, oh, it all looks fine. <laughs> and so like all the things that had showed up on um, the scans and all the things that they were worried about, you know, from a genetic point of view were all just, it was all mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> Um, but it's quite funny because I wrote about this recently as part of my new book and I, I kind of recognized, um, I don't know if it was for the first time or whether I acknowledged it for the first time, but like there was a lot of trauma that we both experienced at that time, um, just like through that, through that birth, um, kind of process. Um, and so now he's, so he still does have a chromosome disorder. He, like we're kind of we've got season tickets for the NHS right like um, he needs a lot of operations and stuff uh, and various things but also he's like the you know most lovely smiley happy little autistic boy right so mm -hmm. um, he's he's such a joy and I think when I think about struggle and think about the sort of surprises in, the, in shitty moments it kind of leads me back to what I wrote in the the fifth, fifth anniversary edition of Productivity Ninja, which was at the back, it was like, thanks to Roscoe, you have taught me more about productivity than anyone else I know. And the reason I said that is because I think, uh, and there was a line in, there's this really amazing 
um, show that I saw on Netflix called Life Animated, which is about a kid with autism. And the mum, when... So he has regressive autism, so at the age of two, he gets diagnosed. And she's talking about how she has to kind of reevaluate her whole life and parenting through this diagnosis. And, she's, and she actually said, um, we had to really rethink what a productive life really means mm -hmm. and i think that you know that little clip in life animated i you know i remember seeing it and just thinking oh yeah like that's just like absolutely like spoke to me as this thing where because i sort of know that he is never going to win the 100 meters and i know that he's never going to be the gold star student at school uh because he's really behind you know uh, and I know that there's a lot of physical limitations that he has, whatever. But I also know that he's having a brilliant time and creates in incredible moments and mm. is someone who really brings a lot and really lights up a lot of different people's lives. And so kind of that realisation for me that actually you don't need to... Uh, yeah, like you don't need to define success and productivity by you know such standard measures actually it's whatever you want it to be it was yeah. just like a huge lesson so like when i when i thought about struggle and when i thought about shittier moments that was a particularly kind of shitty period for me but actually one that i look back on now um just with a lot of gratitude for and mm -hmm. just there were some real gifts that that came through that so there you go yeah. that was just thought i'd share yeah, that because you you told me to on email <laughs> yes <laughs> Yeah, because I think, you know, that's what I want this book to do is to help people to have a different conversation and a different sort of thought about struggle. So rather than just, oh, that was a shit moment, let's just move that, move on, file it away. Or 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 if you, if you haven't moved on, that actually you just feel like you're stuck in it. That actually it's that whole, so I, in the back of the book, um, I call it the three shits. So you've got, you know, oh shit is the, the recognition of, and that kind of compassion for yourself of going, yeah, this is shit or this does hurt and there is trauma there. Um, then the second is what is the shit? So that's when we can activate curiosity. That's when we can dig deeper to go like, what is this actually? What am I actually dealing with here? So what does my lizard brain want to tell me? But also what else can it be? Um, and then the third is holy shit. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, ah, that's you. It's the revelation. It's the... Yeah. The, yeah, the truth, the beauty, the gift, the gratitude, or whatever it is, it's the treasure that comes out of it. And um, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is finding treasure and how we think of treasure as being the thing that we put on display in a museum or in, like bright lights and all clean and stuff like that. But yeah, where we keep our treasure is not where we find it. Where we find it is often like in caves or, mm. you know, in you know hidden away somewhere so it's it's in the middle of the shit is where we find those treasures and then we can take them and put them somewhere else but it's recognizing that actually if you know that there is treasure to be found then when you're waiting in 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 shit you know it's your yes it is still shitty but it's not just shit there will be like light in the middle of that there will be things that that it, you know, is 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 a gift is beautiful is um is an opportunity um and those those kind of treasures you, know, you, you can kind of if you know that it's there you can always set your radar slightly differently yeah um, and start to notice those in the moment there's light in the middle of the tunnel as well if you just turn your torch on right <laughs> yeah exactly so like we talk about needing light at the end of the tunnel um but actually when we yeah, we talk about how we want to find or see light at the end of the tunnel but actually where we need the light is in the tunnel because yeah. you know then actually maybe there's work we need to do in the middle of the tunnel so it's not just about getting through this it's about what what am i here to do what's the you know what's the work i can do here so like in, if you're in the middle of a, a conflict situation for example and you're like oh i just wish this would go away maybe shining the light in the middle of the tunnel is about going actually how can i what's the best thing i can do for this relationship right here in the middle of this this kind of messy bit um and sometimes those are like the groundbreaking things and that can happen you know in in a working relationship or any kind of relationship really yeah um that feels like such a good place to finish up so do you want to just tell people where they can get the book where they can connect with you and yeah anything else you want to share yeah absolutely so the book if you go to strugglethebook.com 
you'll find details about that. <laughs> it is available in all the places where you would find books. Um, it's available for pre-order now. And um, yeah, so I'd love you to, to kind of go, go have a look at that. If you want to find out more about me, I'm gracemarshall.com. And um, I'm on the usual or most of the social media places. So I'm usually Grace Marshall or Grace Marshall Ninja on Instagram. But um, yeah, definitely. I mean, this is about getting the conversation started. So I, I love to hear from people and love to hear from you in terms of like where you're at with this, what you what you love in the book, what you found really, you know, what you didn't like in the book. You know, I, I want to know all of that because I want to have that conversation with you. I have a feeling you're going to be getting some some cool emails over the next year as well. So uh, congratulations again on the book. Great to have you as our first ever returning, returning. busy guest. <laughs> and uh, Grace Marshall, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Graham. This video is sponsored by Think Productive, home of the Productivity Ninja. We help people and organisations to increase their impact and make space for what matters through a range of workshops, programmes and coaching. Head to thinkproductive.com to find out more. Are you interested in booking me as a speaker for your event? You want to sign up for my Rev Up for the Week email? Do you want to buy some of my books? Or do you just want to find out what I'm doing right now? It's all at grahamalcott.com forward slash links. And if you like this video, please like, subscribe and share so we can make more. Thanks for watching.